it and see how, how, far, how much of this we can get through in one session. Uh, so preliminary remarks. Um, as, as I hope you all know when you signed up, this course is, uh, is taught in English, uh, regrettably. The problem there is, is me. I don't know Icelandic. Uh, I'm trying to learn it. I go through, I've been in Iceland for years. But I worked at an English-speaking company. I never really hear Icelandic. And you know, of course, Icelanders, especially young ones, are also good at English. That the incentive to learn it is not good. Uh, people will always talk to you in English. So, uh, but I am trying to learn. But uh, I'm in the rudimentary stages, and there's just no way I could possibly teach. I mean, I, I can't. You know, I can. I can almost go to bonus and speak <laughs> Icelandic. Uh, that's that's the level I'm at. So the teaching has to be in English. Um, so I apologise for that. I'm sorry, but I hope you can handle it. Um, not only that, not only it will be done in English, it will be done in Scottish English, which is <laughs> is even worse. And I, I am conscious of that. Um, so if you have problems understanding me because you know the accent, or you know maybe I, I speak a bit too quickly for you, at any time if, if I'm not being clear, just put your hand up or shout out. Uh, I, I might even use. Um, there are some words in the Scottish vernacular that are not common in English. So I might say like a phrase that you don't know the meaning of or a, an obscure word. Again, in all cases, just let me know and I'll try and clarify what I'm, what I'm saying. Uh, OK, I'm sure there are some other things I ought to mention at this stage, but they've fallen out of my head. So I think we'll just get into the, uh, the material. Uh, so the way I do this is I've got a bunch of slides that I've created for the course and they're hosted online and I'll give you the URL to those at the end of each lecture so that allows you to revise them by just looking at them after the fact. So that means you don't really need to take notes or anything. You know, everything that you see projected here, you'll have access to yourself. Uh, so that's hopefully useful. Um, and that's probably all I need to say to get started. So let me just switch across. Uh, to, yeah, I shouldn't really be doing that. Um, that one there. Okay. So we'll begin now. So here you are, uh, TOL 308G. Um, and uh, I've got some instructions here on these slides. This is to kind of let you know what you do if you're reviewing the slides yourself. So this is a slideshow. It's all done on the web. And uh, it just you page through the slides interactively. So you press space. And you get the next little paragraph comes up. This system ought to work in any contemporary browser. I personally use one called Brave. Does anyone know about the Brave browser? A couple of people. So it's it's derived from Chromium. So it's, it's like Chrome, but it's got some of the kind of Google ad tracking stuff pulled out of it. It's a slightly kind of privacy focused anti advert, uh, you know, built an ad blocker type of thing. So that's the one I use which I tried to install here, but it wouldn't let me. Uh, so I'm having to show you this in Chrome, which is tolerable, and they're fairly similar. Uh, so um, This is kind of historical info from when I'd, I've done a version of this course in the past and found that the Firefox browser didn't always agree with the slideshow. It would get some things wrong. That's probably not the case anymore, but just in case you have problems, I, I can vouch for Chrome working and Brave working. The others are probably fine, but I, I wouldn't know. All right, so here we are. What are we doing? Well, uh, as, as should be clear from the title, it's a course in computer game programming. That's easy enough. But also, specifically, it's more about the, the kind of technical side of things. Um, it's kind of engine level tech and very programming focused. It, not in the first week. The first week's actually a bit different, where I, I kind of uh, set the scene and, and cover some historical background things. But the course itself is very programming centric and it's all about building up week after week as you will write code that gets you closer and closer to being a real game. And by the end of the course, the hope is that you'll actually have made a, a proper legitimate computer game that you can show people and, uh, and play and have fun with. Uh, so having said that, it is just about the, the tech side. So it's not about game design. I don't kind of discuss that at any length. It's not about issues of art or production when it comes to getting art resources. You know, do what you like, just, you know, get public domain art or, you know, just kind of random scribbles or something. Programmer art, as we call it, right? Uh, I won't, I won't be judging you on your, uh, your artistic ability, uh, to, to some relief, <laughs> it would appear. Um, and it's not about things like production and all those other disciplines, audio. Um, that's, that's not where we are. But as I said, it's really about engine tech and the things that make games actually work, uh, under the hood. 
But having said that, uh, it's also not about using third party engines. Uh, you sometimes get modern game programming courses. What they do is they, they teach you how to use like, uh, Unity or Unreal or things like that, which are these pre-existing engines that are now very sophisticated. And that's, that's fine. That has its place. That's one way of doing it. But I find that if you throw people in with all that stuff, there's, there's kind of a bit too much magic in the box. You know, the game engine is doing all sorts of fancy stuff that you don't necessarily know much about. And when you're using the game engine, it's a bit more like you're, you know, you're using a database or a spreadsheet. You know, it's, it's some somebody else's big system and you're just putting stuff into it. And that's not really what I wanted to, to do in this course. I want you to, to build your own engine, basically. A primitive one, of course, but enough that you understand how things really work. So in that sense, uh, what I want you to do is really make a computer game from scratch, so to speak. Uh, now, there's a famous quote about doing things from scratch by a guy called Carl Sagan. Does anyone know who Carl Sagan was? You do? Oh, you're all educated people. That's good. So this is from, uh, from Cosmos, the series he made in the late 70s, early 80s, recently remade by Neil deGrasse Tyson, but I think Carl's one was better. Uh, so this is a, a, a clip from that program where uh, Sagan was discussing what it, what it means to make something from scratch. If you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. Thank you very much. Okay, so I think some of you got the point there that if you're really strict about from scratch, I mean, what is that? You know, ultimately, you would have to go to the absolute foundations of everything, which you kind of can't do. Uh, so it's a relative term. And I'll just sort of paraphrase what he said. If you wish to make a computer game from scratch, you must first invent the universe. Well, that's, that's not what this is a course in as such, although maybe there's a point where we'll talk about it. Um, but what I mean by from scratch is that we're not using third party engines. Uh, we're not even using frameworks or libraries uh, that exist. And we're just going to write like every every line of the code for the game will actually be sort of handcrafted. Now, I say every line again. What does that mean, right? Because uh, there's, there are definitional questions there. The the way we're going to make the games in this class is we're going to make them run on the web because it's just such a convenient delivery platform. You know, instead of having to like install an executable and then decide you know whether it's for the Mac or the PC or the various hoops you have to jump through. You just put it on the web, and then it kind of runs on anybody's computer, mostly. Um, but we're not going to write a web browser, so we're not really writing every line. And uh, we're not going to write our own compiler for the language that we're using. And we're not going to write our own operating system. Those are all things that are happening under the hood, or the firmware that's inside the, uh, you know, that, that the operating system is built on top of, or the microcode, which is the thing that defines what the instructions are inside the chip. They are actually programmed nowadays sometimes. Um, and we're not going to design our chip. So you can see that, you know, it, it, there's a big stack that you're always building on. You're never really doing things from scratch. So if that's the case, that we're not doing it from scratch, why not just say to hell with it and, and put, an, put one layer on top and, and take an engine and build from there? Well, that's not unreasonable, but it would make things too easy because the engines do a lot of the hard work. And uh, you won't learn as much, I think, because, you, you know, again, as I said, too much of the magic is hidden from you. Uh, but if, pragmatically speaking, if you were trying to make a game in the real world, you know, to earn a living or something, you'd certainly be worth thinking about, should I build on a standard engine? And if the thing you're doing is within the scope of those engines, you probably should nowadays. I mean, they're not even expensive anymore. A, a lot of them, they, they, they're actually like nearly free, and they just take a cut if you get very large sales numbers. That wasn't always the case. I remember back in the day, I worked on things where if you wanted an engine license, it cost you a million dollars. To get to, to, to be able to use Unreal in your game, um, but it's all very different now. Nevertheless, I still think that building your own engine level stuff is, is a good thing to do. You'll learn a lot from it, and that's the way we're going to approach this course. So the idea is, when you're finished with this course, you'll be able to make kind of uh, arcade-style games, not like a not a totally contemporary game, of course. They're too complex. They require hundreds of people working for years. So you'll be making the kind of things that were made in the 90s. Uh, you know, arcade games or kind of games you maybe have some nostalgic awareness of from when you were young. Not quite sure, depending on your age. Uh, but that's the kind of level of thing that we'll do. Because it turns out those kind of games 
can be made nowadays and will run on the web, even though the web is kind of inefficient, you still get away with it. They can run on the web and a small group of people can make one in a couple of weeks. That's, that's the way things are now. And having done all that, you'll know a bit about how engines work. You'll be able to evaluate real world engines and uh, have more of a sense as to what they're doing. All right, so, oh yes, who am I? Uh, and, uh, and why am I teaching this course? Well, I'm actually, a, I am a professional games programmer. I'm not a university lecturer. Um, I do this as a sideline, but my real job is, is actually make games for a living. And I've been doing that since the 90s, when I, when I left uni. Uh, some of my past crimes include that one. Anyone remember Grand Theft Auto? Yeah. yeah. Have, have, have any of you actually played the original one, the rubbish one from the 90s? Yeah. Well, I made it. Uh, not on my own. There were other people involved. I occasionally have to admit that. Um, the, the, the specific thing I did on Grand Theft Auto is uh, I wrote the physics system for it. So uh, it's a, there's kind of a big story here. We, we were making this back in Scotland uh, in, in a place called Dundee where I used to live in the 90s. And uh, the team had the game kind of up and running, but the physics system for the vehicles wasn't working very well. They couldn't really get them to drive in a nice way. And I had some ideas about how to do it. So I put together a kind of what's called a, a 2D rigid body dynamics system and uh, did it as a little experiment kind of in my own time, actually. Um, and that was like almost 25 years ago today. I did it in 1996, around this time of the year. Um, so I put this together and showed it to them as a demo, and they thought it was good, so we, we integrated it into the game, and the physics in, in GTA for the vehicles and the bikes and everything is all based on that thing that I did. So here's just a little clip of it in action. So at this point here, when the cars are just driving along the road, as you probably can realise, they're kind of on rails, you know, they're just following like a pre-programmed path, they're not really driving. But when you steal one, or crash into one, it switches on the physics system, and then they actually try to like really simulate the behaviour of the car, so it works out, you know, the friction on the tyres and all this kind of stuff gets computed in a kind of simple way. That's what happens here in a minute. Okay. One little thing to notice, things up there when it, when it did the skid around the, around the corner, there's nothing special going on there. Uh, the skid just comes out of the physics system. Previously, what they tried to do is detect, you know, if you're going above a certain speed and you turn like a large amount, then it's kind of, you call the skid function and it does a bunch of stuff that makes you skid, but it would never quite work. It was always too kind of twitchy and it, you know, it wouldn't always trigger properly. Whereas with a, with a physics system, the skid is just, a natural consequence of the forces that are happening. So it all just kind of happens without any special behaviour. The only special thing is we then had a bit of code that would try and figure out if you were uh, if you were kind of moving in a skid-like way so that you knew you play the skid noise and to drop the little marks. But that was that's after the fact. You know, the system would try and detect that the if the friction on the tires was above a certain amount, then that probably meant you were skidding. But the skid behaviour itself was just emergent behaviour that came out of the physics. So that was how all that worked. Um, then a couple of years later, in the late 90s or early 2000s, I did a thing called Weld Metal Country. That's, uh, again, with a small team of, like, you know, maybe four programmers and four artists. Um, and we took the, the ideas from the GTA physics system, extended them into three dimensions, which is still quite novel at the time. But I remember that this was quite... This was quite early days for 3D stuff, and, uh, and we created a 3D tank combat game that's happening on some alien planet somewhere. And um, this is actually the, my favourite of the games that I've made, uh, personally. And there's some, there's some crazy person on YouTube 
who likes the game and is still playing it 20 years later <laughs> and, and upload videos of it. it. It wasn't a big success or anything. I, I mean, I think it's a good game, but uh, you know, you probably won't have heard of it. Um, we also had like a multiplayer mode. You could play this on a LAN with like eight people. That was that was the way. It was at its best on a LAN. It was a real lot of fun driving around, shooting your pals at, at lunchtime. That's what we did while we were developing it. And there's some nice things going on here. There's some quite good AI, like these uh, flying craft are tracking you, and the AI has got kind of an emotional state. It can be you know aggressive or fearful. They can gang up on you. They can sort of realise whether they're winning or not, and that changes their own behaviour patterns all of which was quite good for its period. But there are some deficiencies as well. You probably notice that the, the texturing is very repetitive. That's because very limited memory back then. We only had a couple of megabytes worth of texture space. So the, the terrain is a big regular grid and the tiles have to be reused across it, which is just sort of the way things were back in those days. We also had to write this game so that it would work whether or not you had a 3D card. Um, in the 90s, 3D accelerator cards were not universal yet. They were like a new thing. So you had to have like a software renderer where you actually drew all the pixels, uh, you know, explicitly you had to write triangle drawing routines and everything like that. Uh, and then, but this is running in hardware. So this could also run under, you know, direct 3D or those sort of 3D APIs that we have nowadays. So that was uh, that little game. Uh, then, um, does, anyone, does anyone know about the Dreamcast? So the Dreamcast was a, a fairly short-lived console from again early 2000s. It was a competitor with the, what, the PS2 probably, um, and we, we ported World Metal to that and had to make some changes to make it fit on this uh, separate device. Uh, the, by the way, the, uh, the the Dreamcast was a, a Sega Microsoft co-production, and I think they kind of fell out with the companies fell out with each other as they always do. And Microsoft said, screw this, we're making our own computer. And that's where the Xbox came from, basically. It was the, the aftermath of the Dreamcast. Um, so I won't show you that. It's the same idea, but just on a different piece of hardware. Um, then I continued to work on Scotland. We, then we heard a crackdown, you know, the crackdown games that are on the, the uh, Xbox. So I worked on those. I won't show you it at length, but it's a, this is a kind of a urban chaos game. You're a superheroed guy. You run around in a city. Blowing things up. Those two words run. Uh, the same holds true for another game. Called... The killing of the innocent is unacceptable, Agent. As I'm recording this, Crackdown 2, the sequel to this game, was just released, and I figured before I play Crackdown 2, I should play the first one. And this game was donated by Nick in Des Moines, Washington. A first impression. Anyway, that's better left for. So anyway, Crackdown's a kind of a bit like a. A bit like GTA 3 or something like that, but with like a super-powered super powered protagonist. That was sort of what was going on there. Uh, then the next thing I did, again, back in Scotland, was one called APB, All Points Bulletin. And it was, again, to me, APB was like a, a, a an MMO game, you know, a massively multiplayer game, uh, supposedly. And basically, it was our attempt, I would say, our attempt at doing GTA, GTA Online before the GTA guys did. Uh, I should point out, at this point, although I'd worked on the early GTA, um, subsequently that was done by a, a separate team in Edinburgh, and I stayed in Dundee working on a, a kind of rival company. Um, and APB was our kind of GTA-like thing. And this is just someone... Uh, mucking about with it and making the cars behave in a very silly way. Uh, this is not realistic gameplay. I think they've tampered with it. This was somebody like editing it for fun. Just to muck about.
I should point out that the real game, the environments are busier than that. They've got pedestrians and stuff in them as well. But I think this was, they, they took it out so they could make this little silly demo thing. Um, and this is all quite old stuff now. This is like uh, APB is over 10 years old. Uh, so it's kind of ancient history itself now. Um, um, and then after that, I moved to Iceland. And uh, for the past 10 years, I've been working at CCP on EVE Online. I, I think you all know EVE Online. You get the idea of what it is, so we don't need to dwell on it. All right, so that's that's my kind of background and how I got here. So now we'll do a quick course outline just to let you know what you're going to do. Basically, the course is fairly clearly divided into like a theme per week uh, that builds up to your, your end state where you make your own game. So the first week is what we're doing right now, the intro. I won't say any more about that, otherwise I would recurse infinitely. Uh, and then, so once we get through all this, um, oh, in fact, also this week, there are kind of two themes this week. There's the intro, and then I'm going to do a bit of the a kind of history of computer games, just to kind of establish some context as to how games got to be where they are just now. Um, and then next week, we'll kind of start the programming part of the course. Um, the, the programming that we do, because it's for the web, is going to be done in, in JavaScript, which is potentially a, a debatable uh, de decision, but I found that it actually works okay, even though JavaScript has got some flaws as a language. It's, uh, it's, it's perfectly adequate for the task. Um, and my understanding is that, that you, you might not all know JavaScript, but you've probably done, I think you've had to do Java. Is that still the case for your introductory courses? Now, JavaScript is not Java, um, but there's enough similarity that if you know the syntax of one, learning the other is not terribly hard. So next week, I do a kind of quick crash course to get you up to speed with JavaScript, uh, assuming that you already know Java or, or C++ or something like that. Um, and, I, and I'll do enough about HTML5 to teach you the things that you need to do the, the kind of graphics and stuff that we're going to use in the course. So that'll be next week. Uh, then we talk about the main loop, which is the kind of inner logic of a game, the thing that makes handles the way time passes and how the whole the whole thing cycles. Uh, then we'll have a look at bit, a bit of a look at rendering. Now, when I say rendering, I don't mean fancy 3D stuff. Uh, this course is predominantly going to use 2D graphics to keep it simple, and because literally 3D graphics is its own subject, and I believe you have one, don't you? There's a 3D graphics course here. Um, I, I kind of part of me wanted to put 3D in. But I'd have to add like weeks of extra material to explain it all, and that would push everything else out. So I've decided to focus on 2D graphics and 2D games with the understanding that once you know how to do that, extending it into 3D isn't that big a deal. You just add one more D. You just, you just, you just add a Z. You've got your X and Y's, put a Z on, that's it, 3D. Uh, there's a bit more to it than that, but then that's what your 3D graphics course will help you with. Uh, Okay, then we look at simulation updates, because rendering is one part of games, but the other part is how you make the, the world inside the game evolve over time. You know, things like how your collision detection might work, or how the objects, you know, move through space over time, or all the other stuff that's going on. So that's that part of it. And at that point, you know enough to basically make a game. So by about five weeks in, we'll do that. We'll, we'll make a quick game in class, hopefully. Uh, then we look at sprites, which is a little graphics technology that was used in the old days for 2D stuff that we'll be making a lot of use of. And then into the second half of the course, it gets a bit more advanced. We start looking at things like uh, like physics and dynamics, not to the level of our full rigid body dynamic system, but something close to it. You learn a bit about how to make things uh, move around in an interesting way. Then some technical things, memory management, object lifetime. These are quite subtle things that we, you need to know about. Collision detection, OK. Uh, forgive me for just reading out the slides, by the way. I know it's slightly bad form, but I have to tell you what's going to be here, and I want the slides to be a record when you're, re when you're revising. So there will be a certain amount of me just echoing the slides. Uh, OK, diagnostics, you can read that. We'll talk a bit about networking. It's a really interesting topic, You know how you create a multiplayer game, especially if the players are distributed across the planet, how you coordinate, you know, the getting all the messages from one machine to the other so that everyone kind of agrees, sort of, on what's going on in the game. I'm sure you've seen the consequences when that goes wrong when you're playing multiplayer games. Uh, we'll even talk a bit about AI. Now, again, AI in its fullest sense is, of course, its own huge subject. 
Uh, and the kind of so-called AI that exists in games is actually usually fairly simple. You know, it's just root finding, basically. But I'll talk a bit about that and some parts of the, the, the what I think are the more interesting parts of AI, just for completeness, uh, even though game AI is, is still at a fairly primitive stage in a lot of ways. Okay, some other things. And I'll, I'll maybe say a bit about how EVE works, because it's a, a really quite peculiar game. EVE behaves differently from uh, any other game that I uh, know about. Uh, so as I've said earlier, the, the way this course works is um, I will make these slides available to you and the lectures are me going through the slides and talking about them. Then I'll provide you with the link so that you can revise them because the, the exam basically focuses on uh, did you remember what I taught in the, the lectures? That's what that really is all about. Um, we also have tutorials and the tutorials are hopefully more interactive where you can come along and talk to me about stuff. Uh, of course, in general, once we get up and running, there will be a homework exercise every week, and part of the tutorial will be you come along, and if you're having problems with the homework or questions, you come and ask me about it. Hopefully, we're going to get a teaching assistant as well, and uh, she'll be here and will we'll help with that too. But also, any questions that come out of the lecture material that you just want to talk about a bit more or have clarified, the tutorials are where we try and deal with all that. Uh, yeah, so as I say, there'll be weekly programming exercises, and they, they build on each other. They, they sort of cumulatively work towards being a, a game at the end. Uh, and when it gets to the final grade, it will basically be a three-way split. Uh, the exact percentages I'll, I'll clarify with you later, but basically about a third of the course will be uh, a third of your grade will come from the homework assignments. A third will come from the final project, which is uh, actually uh, the idea is that I'll put you together in groups of maybe four people or something, and you make your own game kind of of your own choice, although I have to I have to sort of check that it's a reasonable idea, but uh, basically you make your own little game, that'll be a, a third of the grade, and then the other third is the final exam, which is the part that kind of tests whether you were turning up to the lectures and paying attention. And uh, that exam, yeah, it'll be a closed book thing, and uh, is basically, a, mostly is about revising what you see here. It might contain a small amount of programming work, but it won't really be a programming-centric exam because you'll have done a lot of programming in the homeworks and in your project. Okay, so that was about me. Um, about you, I've looked at the the sign-up thing to get an idea as to like what courses you're coming from and what year of study you're in. So I think most of you appear to be second or third year computer science students. You nod along if that describes you, your second or third year computer. Okay. Is anyone not like that? I think we maybe have someone from like another discipline, like a chemist or something. Hello? Yes? yes. Uh, what are you? Um, You're... I'm doing yeah. a PhD. Oh, right. Okay. Oh, well, nice to have you here. Hope you enjoy it. And are you a, a non CS? Uh, no, I was just technically a fourth year because I. Oh, right. Okay. All right. So I think, but I think it's, it's mostly CS people. Uh, that's fine. And a couple of other people who wanted to be here. You're more than welcome. Um, do you all have your own personal web space available on Ugla? Uh, my understanding is you, that you do. Is that yeah? That's good. So you won't need that to begin with. Uh, the first couple of weeks, the homeworks are going to be done through a website that will point you at. But at some point, you'll be doing stuff that's complicated enough that you'll want to host it yourself on your own web page. So uh, you'll you'll have to use that a uh, couple of weeks from now. Um, tutorial groups. So this is the thing where. Um, sometimes the class gets split into two different tutorial groups, um, and you each have like your own, you know, two-hour tutorial block. The thing is, the class this year being only about 50 people, it might be possible that we only need one tutorial block. Uh, so I'm not sure. We'll still check with the admin people as to whether you get put into like tutorial group A or tutorial group B, and uh, we'll just need to see how that comes out in the scheduling. I don't know yet. All right, so to give you an idea of what you'll hopefully, <laughs> oh, is that, is that annoying? It's quite, uh, quite garish, isn't it? I'm sorry. Um, just to give you an idea of the kind of things that you that hopefully will be able to make at the end of the course, I've got some videos here of games that were made by students in previous years. I, I don't teach this course every year. I kind of teach it maybe every other year if I'm available. I've um, been doing it for a little while. So these are some kind of older projects that were done just to give you a feel of what you might be able to do by, by the end. Uh, so this is a this is a variant of a, an old game called um, Robotron. Do any of you know Robotron? No, it's maybe too obscure. So this was like a popular arcade game in the 80s, 
made by uh, Eugene Jarvis, who's the guy who made Defender. You maybe heard of Defender. It was a more famous game. Anyway, it, this is a, one of these crazy kind of bullet storm games where it's just like stuff's all over the place and you shoot it in all directions and it's kind of psychedelic and intense. That's the actual in-game audio for that game. Uh, this team seems to be really good. At, or I don't really teach much about audio. I just tell you how to play a sound sample. But they were really keen and they, they made their own music or something. Um, uh, so this is another nice one. They're an old arcade game from the late 80s, I think, called R-Type. Anybody know about R-Type? No? Again, it's maybe too obscure now. But it's, it's, I used to play this in the arcades myself. Uh, I really like this one. It's a horizontally scrolling space shoot 'em up game thing. And the, one of the teams made a clone of it. The, the video actually doesn't do this justice. The, the real game ran faster than this, but the, the video is a bit low frame rate, but the game itself is better. Okay, and just one more. This was a slightly different style. This one is called the Gerbil Space Program. Um, I think you get the idea. Anyone recognize that spaceship? I should hope so. So that is the end of that little slide deck, and uh, I suppose I should terminate the recording here as well. Just as a final remark, we will of course we'll, be, we'll continue and do some other stuff, but I'll try and break this up into sections that correspond to lecture length. Uh, so I'll, I'll close this one off now and see if it archives properly and see if the audio works. That would be nice to know. All right, so I'll stop it.